so my name is Hannah Goodman. Um, I teach chemistry. I've taught here for five years. Um, my background is in biology, uh, physical science, and earth space. Um, okay, so I've always loved nature. I've always loved science. Um, I was inspired by a science teacher who, in, uh, bio, in AP Biology, and she was talking about lipids and um, why soap doesn't wash them off. And someone said, well, can't you just melt it off with hot water? And she looked at him and said, leaving a monomolecular lipid layer? And that hooked me. Because you can't, I mean, God bless the humanities, but you can talk around it, but when it comes to science, you cannot pretend it's not there. Um, so I just thought that was really cool. Um, I love biology, but I like chemistry more because you really get down to this invisible level and you can understand how things, how things tick. But then I got tired of the invisible and I like to walk outside and, and you know, be in nature. Um, I have four kids, I have a granddaughter that, who I love very much, and I'm just, I'm very involved in my kids' lives. I have an extended family, we spend a lot of time together. Sometimes it has to be on the phone because we live far away, but you know, we're all part of each other's lives. Um, me personally, I, I got into butterfly gardening in about 2008. Um, my daughters woke me up and said, Mommy, you have to come, you have to come, it's a miracle. And we went to this lemon tree that someone had given us, and there were two giant swallowtails that had just come out of their chrysalis. And it really was like a miracle because their chrysalis looks like a little piece of wood. Um, so that just, that hooked me and I started getting interested in that. Um, meanwhile, I was just, you know, teaching various things, teaching earth space, teaching biology, and then I got into, into chemistry. Um, when I came here, I, w I didn't really, wasn't really looking for a new job, but I was introduced to the school by uh, one of my mentor, Carlos Montero, and I just fell in love with the way the kids were so interested in learning. Um, and the way you, you don't waste a lot of time on standardized tests and all this other foolishness. You really spend time with the, with the um, topics and then there's lots, of, there's lots of rules, don't get me wrong, but you can actually differentiate for individual kids and that really, really got to me. Um, I think it was my second year teaching or my third, I started working with some highly gifted kids. And this is something I've always wanted to do. Um, and they just were, they had already basically taught themselves the course, so then the question is, well, what are we gonna do? And we talked about it, and they decided they wanted to write a book. So they wrote the, wrote the book for the course. So that was my first time working with, you know, specifically with the highly gifted. And I, I, like I said, I always wanted to do that. Um, then, that, it kind of went from there, and I got involved with a, this young man who's doing uh, very into butterfly gardening. People, I'm his mentor in terms of project management. He's my mentor in terms of butterflies, because he knows a lot more than I do. Um, and that's been a great joy. So, and, and I've really, it's brought out the um, latent environmentalist in me, because that's always been an interest of mine. So right now, three of the mentees I work with are doing environmental projects. Um, Duncan German is working with butterflies. Joey Goldstein is working um, with uh, ocean life. And uh, Nicole Loho is working with recycling. And then I'm working with two others, one, Rohan Chiaoferi, who's helping me rework the chemistry curriculum in Ariel Arias, who's uh, making a mentorship uh, initiative with the lower school and middle school. Um, so that's a great joy in my life to actually be able to work one-on-one -on -one with kids like that. But I just feel like there are so many kids at this school who benefit from that extra, a little bit of extra attention, like not that they need it in order to survive or anything, but because they're interested in learning more from other people about I don't know, it's just, they're just open to new ideas. They want to learn from other people. And I want to learn from them because whenever I teach, I'm teaching a subject and they're teaching me how to teach. You know, and as they ask me questions, I also learn more about the subject because they'll challenge me and I'll go, I don't know, I don't know that, I have to go find out. You know, and that's, that pushes, pushes me every day to learn something new.
My name is uh, Mr. Dybert. I've been here at U School for 15 years. I teach uh, math fellows, uh, uh, pre pre-calculus and AP calculus, and I do the math team uh, along with Ms. Pullen and Ms. Osborne and Mel Theta along with Ms. Smith and the Win Club, which is a big community service organization. And that's where we do a lot of the activities like the Jamaica uh, trip. We run the school store and do about a monthly service project uh, to get kids involved in community service. So the Wing Club uh, does almost about a project every month. We start the school year by doing a back to school collection for, for kids that outgrew their uniforms during the summer and we send them to the to Tahiti and Jamaica and the different organizations we work with uh, for kids that need them. Uh, then we did a hurricane relief uh, for the Bahamas this year and worked with several other clubs and organizations and did a school wide drive uh, to collect needs for Bahamas. Uh, we did a Halloween uh, outreach at the Jack and Jill Center and Salvation Army in Fort Lauderdale with a trunk or treat and collected Halloween costumes for kids that needed them. In November, we're doing a um, work with the Key Club on a, uh, a food drive to help um, uh, local families in need right in our community. So one of our big events is uh, Jamaica, and this got started many years ago. I've been here 15 years, and uh, my first year here I was teaching geometry, and I told some stories of uh, when I was uh, the year before starting at U School. Uh, I worked uh, with disaster relief and traveled around different natural disasters and helped rebuilding homes and uh, told stories of how the construction workers were using three, four, five triangles and right triangles and Sokotoa um, building houses. And the, the kids were really impressed to see uh, math being used out in everyday life. And one of my students at that time uh, really interests him. Uh, his uh, grandparents lived in South America and there was a natural disaster down there. And he said, hey, let's do a fundraiser to help, help out that country. So that's when the Wind Club was founded about 15 years ago. Um, it's been going strong ever since and um, sometime during that time we started the school store kind of to help collect all the funds to help pay for natural disasters whenever they would come up um, and then there, we had a student Matthew Lynn um, who about five years ago who uh, did a summer internship with Food for the Poor and came back and said hey could we uh, do you think we could actually raise money to pay for a house in um, in Haiti or Jamaica and so every year we made our goal to raise three thousand six hundred dollars that actually pays for the materials for house. We're doing that for the last five years, and then this last summer uh, we actually took a group of uh, eighteen students and two teachers um, and actually built the house. I think the kids sometimes students think oh, community service is something I have to do and and just something they need to check off their list. And um, I, I my experience with doing these kind of volunteer. Um, activities and and I think the students have found the same thing is that it really is fun it's really uh, uh, it's it's more of a blessing to you you go there thinking you're just doing it to help somebody else and in turn you come back and it just um, it really affects you personally and I found that the kids that get involved with things they're asking me oh when can we do this and they, the kids want to they want to go out and plan more activities and do more to help other people and they really uh, it makes you a different person and I, I think the kids take these things with them on to college. I often have students come back to visit and say, oh, remember we were doing the post office food drive and remember these. And I know for myself personally, those are some of my greatest memories from high school and college is doing them some of those things um, outside of the classroom. And I think it's a great experience and makes students um, different people. thing that I appreciate most in watching students and observing students who are have an active passion project going is the way they light up when they talk about it, the way it has impacted their lives, the way they are so pleasantly surprised at how much their giving back has really benefited them. U School helps me pursue my passion of helping others because the teachers are so supportive. Um, especially 
the music teachers and the art teachers, they provide me with so many opportunities where I can help other kids with what I love, and they're just always there for me. Youth school allows us to like have a platform where we can like recruit people, so like the club never dies down. As long as we like have club meetings that youth school allows us to have and a club advisor, the club will be mm -hmm. passed on from year to year and Achieve can keep thriving like this. Youth school has helped me cultivate my passion by allowing me to photograph events that I wouldn't think would be possible otherwise. Like I've been able to shoot sports games, travel with a football team, hopefully I get to shoot the basketball team and hopefully they make it to finals so I can go up and shoot the championship with them. Not only that, to be able to shoot events and to be given the resources to do uh, work that I feel I can achieve. So I have some amazing teachers here at university school like Ms. Cohen and Ms. Goodman who have been so supportive of my art career and as, um, additionally my club Art from the Heart which um, strives to help um, patients at hospitals to make arts and crafts with them. U School has many clubs and different opportunities that enable me to help the community and people in need. So U School has helped me pursue my passion. So over the past four years I've been taking photography and the first two or three years I've learned techniques that have helped me perfect my images and photos and this year since I'm in AP Photography I have way a lot of flexibility to pursue whatever ideas I really want and the teacher's very helpful like when I need help like coming up with ideas or to perfect them they're very helpful. So you know, so we keep just adding. Use, just use octaves. Yeah, and so you're gonna get that, and so maybe bring. There we go. Type symbol now. Hi, my name is Jessica Muñiz Collado. I'm an assistant professor of music here at Nova Southeastern University, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to work with uh, the university school and our performing visual arts um, areas, specifically in music, to create a commercial music intensive program where students from the U School can come and experience what it's like to be a media composer. They are actually scoring an original piece 
for a video, uh, I believe it's her morning announcement. <laughs> because you're on a tight deadline, it further enhances the experience of what a media composer or film composer has to go through, working on tight deadlines and still creating an effective project for uh, the film or the director, whoever hires them for the project. So it's been really exciting working with the students um, and I hope that this uh, intensive program can definitely um, expand to a much larger audience in the future. Hello, my name is Ronald Baez and I'm the Artistic Director of the After School Film Institute, or ASFI. ASFI is an after school film program that brings professional mentors into schools along with professional gear and state of the art technology to be able to mentor kids and train them on how to use that state of the art technology to make creative decisions and ultimately create a short film for themselves. Those short films are student helmed, though the students are mentored and supervised the entire time the students make all of their own creative decisions. It allows them an opportunity to not only work together and build life skills, but also build technical skills that will help them get into college, as well as become competitive in the workforce. Hi, my name is Howard Jimenez, and I've been with the ASFI program for almost two years now. So we've produced two films so far, and both of those films have been aired on national TV. And it was an amazing experience. Uh, I DP'd the short film, and it was beautiful. We worked from pre to post production. This year, ASFI is really excited to be partnering with NSU University School. While we're bringing some excellent mentors and state-of-the-art technology into these amazing facilities, U School is definitely bringing the talent. Bringing industry professionals, people who are experts in sound, in lighting, in editing, in cinematography, to work with our students to help them dare to dream, to take this and their talent to the next level, so that your students will walk away with the skills to make a short film. If you have any questions or if you're interested in the program, please feel free to visit us at asfi.us for more information. It's one of my favorite memories. Don't wait for tomorrow. Dare to dream today. Hi, my name is Danny Swerdlow. I'm the Director of Arts at NSU University School. And I'm Jen Ladia. I teach Upper School Theater at NSU University School. And we're really excited to give you an inside look into the making of a production, and more specifically into the making of Peter Pan. No one cares where you roam when the skies are your own. Never land. In selecting plays uh, for our season, we have a rubric that hits all the marks that we're trying to incorporate into a production. Uh, for example, things of educational opportunities, the resources we have, um, how it fits into the rest of the season. So when we choose uh, something for an upper school musical, how does it fit with the lower school? How does it fit with the middle school uh, to create a well-rounded season? And it's, it's not nearly as simple as one might think. There's a lot that goes into it. We have to look at the cast size of the production. We have to look at the different types of opportunities there are vocally and musically. Sometimes we'll pick a, a play and we realize that there's a section of our pit that isn't represented, whether it's the strings, percussion, wind instruments. Potentially, it could also be certain students. You know that we are looking at a show that's very heavy in male vocalists when we only have maybe two or three that year. So really, we're kind of pulling the student population, thinking about who's auditioning, who we have in our talent pool, and, and that's just the beginning of it. And then, of course, there's the can we do it factor. <laughs> yeah. You know, with Peter Pan, it was a question of can we fly? Um, certainly with some other productions, it's about whether or not we have the capability to produce the play or perform the play. And there are a number of different factors that would would go into that, whether it's sound, lighting, visuals, set, those are all different parts of the, the equation that we have to figure out really early on. In my role, I often try to stay out of the casting process, um, you know, 
Jen is the director and there's a musical director in the room and a vocal director and a choreographer and sometimes to have too many cooks in the kitchen can be a difficult thing. I like to remain objective and it's always exciting when I get to see which students have been cast in the roles. When casting one of the important things to remember for myself is that it is a puzzle. It's looking at the student and looking at the other students and finding where they fit best so that they are successful. The obstacles that we, I guess, overcame throughout this process aren't really anything different than any other process. There's all these like little moments that will happen in a process that you work together to solve and fix. Um, there were puzzles. Yeah, this one had lots puzzle. of puzzles. It's another puzzle. How are we going to fly? Yeah. What's that going to look like? Yeah. What's Tinkerbell going to be in this performance? Who are you going to cast as Peter Pan? Little little puzzles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and flying was a new thing for me. It's not something that I've had experience with. So as we were staging, we had a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. It's like, well, if your fly line can do this, then this is what we'll do. And luckily, the actors were open and willing to to take that on of, if this doesn't work, I know that this is our next step. This one, I think we really were proactive. Um, our production team was really on top of all of the different factors going into a production. And so I'm you know, generally confident um, in our ability to provide the vision that we originally started with. And I guess something that's a little more of a challenge uh, creatively or thematically or concept wise, um, telling the story of Peter Pan is something that I think the audience, everybody knows the story of Peter Pan, right? Um, uh, it was a big challenge for me to tell this story in a different way that didn't feel the traditional green dress, blue dress. 1954, Kathy Rigby, Yeah, Peter nothing Pan. wrong with Kathy Rigby. No, nobody yes. is. <laughs> yes, but it, it, it was important for us as a team to tell this in a fresh new way. Um, tell this in a fresh new way that was relatable and um, was something that, that felt, felt comfortable. Hi, my name is Rebecca Montero. I am the technical theater coordinator and the lighting designer for Peter Pan. Hi, my name is Liberty Lapioker and I'm the stage manager for Peter Pan. Basically, I run all of the production meetings. Once we've chosen a show, we need to get rights. Um, our lovely director usually does that for us. We get the rights for the show to make sure that we can actually put it on legally. Work with the director closely to do a set design, do costume designs, do all the designs, um, start putting it in the space. I mean, it's, it's everything. It's literally every little detail has somebody checking on it and then has the director overseeing it. The role of a stage manager in a production is to basically manage like the cast and crew and make sure all the students are where they need to be at the right times. I call the cues for the lights to change in the show. It's a stage manager's job to, to keep the integrity of the show based on what the director wants and all of the designers want. Another big part of stage managing is to make sure that everybody's comfortable and so we do something called fight calls where we run all of the the flying and the um, like actual fights so nobody gets hurt. I think just anybody in like a leadership position in the show influences the cast because the cast can see that we're working very hard so it makes them want to work hard and them put up as much effort as we are. I actually don't really wish people knew anything. I, I like that they don't know. It's the magic. They don't know what I do. They don't understand what we do. <laughs> and there's no point in trying to explain it to them. They just should come and enjoy the magic of the show. Uh, hi, I'm Tyler Grimes, and I'm the fight choreographer. Hi, I'm Evan Iglarsh, and I play Peter Pan. Hi, I'm Anthony Langone, and I play Captain Hook. Working with swords on stage is a lot of fun, uh, because kind of it's the dream of everybody, I think, at some point in their lives to get to sword fight. And uh, as a choreographer, uh, that was how I learned how to use those swords first. And uh, you're able to translate that into different types of swords, such as the ones that we use in our show. Tyler's done an excellent job in not only choreographing it, but really helping us uh, learn the complex movements of the sword fights. Getting things timed properly with the score, a lot of, you know, how can I implement the character into the choreography? It requires a different frame of mind. 
Uh, that's sort of why we have a fight call before uh, any sort of fight performance. It's to go over it, it's to, to make sure that we have the steps, but more importantly, um, because stage combat is, is a dance, it is something you need to be in tuned with with your partner. And so a fight call before a show, uh, it's, it's less just to get the moves right, and it's more so the two actors or the three actors, whoever's involved in that fight call, can check in with each other. My name is Sarah Cowley. I teach band, and I also run the pit for our shows. My name is Ali Uchuya, and I'm the student representative for the pit, and I'm first chair bandit. Some challenges definitely would be trying to be kind of a role model for other students and learning my part, even though it's hard for me, I have to kind of show other students that like, you know, you can do it and like help other people. A pit orchestra is a group of, of instrumentalists who come together to, to perform the live music for the show. The challenge that I faced as a clarinet player in the show was a lot of the music, well all the music was written for flute. So all the notes are super, super high. You know, we've each been, you know, uh, uh, like obsessed with our own parts and you finally see how, how the whole thing fits together and it's, it's uh, a magical moment, truly. As a team, we talked through a lot of different scenarios and um, options of where to put the pit for this show. Sometimes we are actually in the pit, uh, in front of the stage. We, we, we talked about this year being uh, on the stage itself, kind of off to the side, but because we're flying, which is super cool, it's not really safe. So um, this year we're gonna be right here in our, in our home, essentially, and we are gonna be using all sorts of technology with our brand new sound system, but we will be absolutely playing live from, from the band room. What I want everybody to know about band kids and pit kids um, is that they really do work incredibly hard, but they, they rise to the challenge consistently. I'm Erin St. John and I'm the choreographic mentor to Bailey in Peter Pan the Musical. I'm Bailey Busher and I am the choreographer for Peter Pan the Musical and I also play a lost boy. As choreographic mentor I'm able to help Bailey the choreographer to give her advice, to suggest other options, guide her through the choreographic process, in Peter Pan in creating the original dance steps. I am the student choreographer for Peter Pan and I come up with the original choreography and steps from the beginning. The audition process was I had to send in a video of choreography that I created for the show and write why I could do the job and like what I would do when I held the position. My concept for the show is basically no one really knows what Neverland is and Neverland is up to the person to decide for themselves. So I decided that each group in Neverland would have very original choreography that was very different from the original cartoon Peter Pan and any other adaptions that have been done of Peter Pan. So it was a lot of fun to come up with very original things that I've never done before. I think some of the challenges that presented themselves was working on the platforms and obviously that we're able to fly choreographically that's a very new skill that we've learned to be able to suspend our um, dancers, actors and give them some choreographic movement while also being hung from the sky which was a very difficult challenge I'm sure that all of the performers experienced. My name is Jen Ladia. In addition to directing Peter Pan, I'm also our school's CAPI mentor, um, in addition to being on the steering committee for the CAPI's program. CAPI's is a critics and awards program uh, for all the schools in Broward and Palm Beach County. So the CAPI's critics and awards program uh, is two parts. Uh, the first part is we have a team of students who go and review other high school shows in the area. They go see the show, they discuss it with a group of 60 students, and then they write a review, which is eligible for publication. Uh, in addition to that critics side of it, we also have the critics come see our show. So they come and they see, they sit, and then they also discuss during intermission and uh, post-show. And decide who is eligible for certain categories similar to the Tony Awards in you know lead actor, lead actress, things of that sort. And at the end of the year there's a Tony style gala for the Cappy's program. So in addition to the the performances on stage, there's also technical elements that go uh, into Cappy's that can be eligible for different categories such as costumes, hair and makeup, publicity, marketing and publicity, 
lighting, sound, all of those categories um, can be student done and student driven. If they are student done and student driven, they're eligible. The root of this program is from that critical perspective of the critics in the room reviewing other shows and that's the that's the driving force that's the educational benefit of Kathy's program the awards are like kind of the cherry on top situation but we really try and enforce our students our team of students to go out and see these shows and really look at other high school theater from a critical perspective and a critical eye my name is Danny Swerdlow. I'm the director of arts at NSU University School and this is our media production team my name is Joel Nemis, and I am the Associate Director of the Arts, and also I teach two of the media production courses. I'm Corky Quakenbush. I'm a middle school and upper school TV production teacher. The way that we video record our musicals, our performances, has changed dramatically, I think, over the years. And as our program has grown and developed to incorporate better resources, we've endeavored to expand our production. One of the things that we will be doing for this production of Peter Pan is a live edit. We have five cameras that are currently located in the theater, and they are network cameras, NDI cameras, and they send signal from the theater here to our control room. We are currently in the studio, U Studio, and um, just outside of this room is our control room where we will have not only those five cameras, but two um, live human-operated cameras as well. So it'll be a seven-camera shoot. That is just on the day of the show. And one of the most exciting things for me is that the students are doing this. So the students are involved. They're doing the camera work, and they're going to be involved in the entire process. So uh, it's really a wonderful opportunity for them as well as for us. There have been so many challenges that we have had to overcome in order to make this filming possible. First, every single one of our network cameras relays a signal back to this room at a different speed. And so one of our first challenges was just synchronizing the different cameras to make sure that they could sync up with the sound. Another challenge that we faced was getting the sound from the soundboard to this room so that what we're actually hearing when we do our live edit is the same quality sound that you are hearing when you're in the audience. It's been really a great uh, process to see as walking into it how much work went into setting these cameras up in a stage and in a theater that have not been meant for that purpose. So the work that's gone into making this a recordable event in such a way that, uh, that the show blends together. And everything has to kind of coordinate. We have to be prepared. So we actually have to kind of know what's going to happen on stage before it actually happens and be prepared for that because in the blink of an eye, we miss it. Something interesting is that our pit orchestra isn't necessarily playing at the same tempo every single time they perform. So whenever we record a song even though that song may sound very similar from one night to the next. In fact, from, a, from an editing perspective, it's almost completely different. It's not just cameras pointing at actors. We have to be here the week of Tech Week so that we can see the performance, know where everybody's going to be, and start to anticipate those movements on stage so that we're there to capture them. When our video goes live, you can find it on sharkmedia.nova.edu. If you look at the left side of the screen and the menu options, you can see NSU University School. Look for our channel of performances and you will find Peter Pan. No, we hope you enjoy the show, um, both the one in the theater and also the one that we broadcast. And thanks to our media productions program and our dedicated students, we have the ability to show you the making of Peter Pan in addition to the performance. So what you're seeing here is really a weaving together of all of the different digital media tools that we have in our media productions program. And so we are so incredibly excited to be able to integrate them and synthesize them to create this kind of synergistic opportunity. Enjoy the shows.